All right. <laughs> so this is Brittany Verico. She's from the University of Vermont. She's going to be talking about the long-term monitoring reveals of forest community change by atmospheric pollution and contemporary climate change. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it because I think I'm going to be a little bit short on time. So the forest community composition and the distribution of individual tree species are both strongly tied to climatic conditions. And so trees are often very sensitive to changes in their local environment, and this is extremely important, important in light of uh, contemporary climate change. Sorry for the weird movement of the screen. Um, and we have seen that through natural and anthropogenically induced climate change, that both of these forces really exert strong influences on shifting the geographical range of individual uh, forest species and community types. So for example, during the interglacial period of warming, through the pollen and fossil and even molecular um, data, we've seen species such as spruce and oak move not only northward, northern, northward but also to higher um, altitudes. And we're starting to see a very similar pattern with forestries um, in recent decades. So a lot of previous work um, has been done in the region to show that uh, northeastern forests are sensitive to not only climate, particularly temperature, but al also atmospheric pollution. And just as a quick uh, review, the low elevation forests um, in this region are characterized by deciduous hardwood trees. We have a boreal forest in the high elevation dominated by spruce and fir. And then in between these two community types, we have a very steep transition zone where species composition is uh, rapidly turnovers. And this transition zone is also referred to as the boreal deciduous ecotone. So with climate warming, we would predict that this ecotone in individual species would move upslope in elevation. And we have seen that uh, in recent decades, but we're also noticing a lot of occurrences where the boundaries of this ecotone in individual species are also shifting downslope, which would suge suggest a more complex response to climate change rather than just a synchronous upslope movement. One of the most influential data sets documenting this change in the ecotone as well as shifts in individual species is this monitoring study that was established on camel's hump. So in 1964, Thomas Sikama established stands across the elevational gradient here in an area of camel's hump that had very minimal logging. And within each of these stands, he established five to 10 different inventory plots. And within each of these plots, all tree species greater than two centimeters diameter at breast height were recorded. And this was done for a total of nine different uh, census periods. The first one was in 1965, and the most recent was in 2015. So what this data set, uh, in my opinion, really represents is the biodiversity of tree species, not only spatially across the elevational gradient, but also temporally. And we're able to take a deep temporal look at the same permanent plots over time, almost like studying um, a cohort uh, of trees. So for my objectives, the first was to characterize the elevational gradient and forest composition and see how that has shifted uh, over a 50 year time period. And then second, to determine the importance of both climate change and atmospheric pollution um, as drivers of temporal shifts in the forest communities. And I wanted to be able to tease these two uh, in umbrella influences apart and look at the entire forest community over time. So one way I did this was with generalized, generalized dissimilarity modeling. And this is a multivariate technique that models the similarity of species composition between sites or between years. So it's a measure of beta diversity in a sense as a function of environmental differences. And I think this will become a bit more clear um, as I walk through the next couple of slides. So without going into too much of uh, the nitty gritty of the details, uh, GDM fits nonlinear I splines to each predictor variable that you have in the model. And these splines or the response curves represents uh, the amount of biological change at any point along an environmental gradient. So for example, the slope can vary at any point along this elevational gradient here in this example. When the response curve is relatively flat, it's indicative that there's not a lot of change in species composition in that particular area of the gradient. And when the slope is steep, it's indicative of high amount of turnover in species composition in that particular part of the uh, elevational gradient. <clears throat> 
So not only is it important to look at the response curve, the shape of that, but the height of the curve also indicates the overall magnitude of change in composition associated with a particular variable. And of course, this spline is going to correspond to some value here on the y-axis. But for the purposes of this talk, this I would just kind of ignore this y-axis. The values here are going to change, but they're really a synthetic parameter of the model that describes the splines. So while important, it's really the curve of the, or the um, shape of the response curve and also the height. So for my climate data, I was interested uh, in looking at mean annual temperature and annual precipitation, and I obtained data from two uh, land stations. And the reason for this is that the Camel Sump Monitoring Study is at such a fine spatial scale that a lot of the climate models and datas are, data sets out there are just too coarse grained. So I used two different land stations, one at Burlington International Airport, which is at 100 meters elevation, and another at the top of Mount Mansfield, which is around 1,200 meters elevation. And I used these two land stations to calculate a lapse rate for both temperature and annual precipitation for each census year. And we were able to validate uh, the lapse rates with in situ data loggers on the Campbell Sun plots. So for example, for every, this is on average, for every 100 meters in elevation you increase, temperature is going to decrease by 0.5 degrees Celsius. And then I took all of the associated uh, or predicted climate variables along the elevational gradient and then associated that data to the Campbell's Hump survey plots. For atmospheric pollution, I was interested in sulfate pollution, which I have denoted as pollutant S in my uh, figures, and then pollutant N, which is ammonium and nitrate pollution combined. And again, I'm using two different data sets, but for a different reason. So the first data set is at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire, and the second is at Underhill, Vermont. So while Underhill is closer to Camel's Hump, it does not, the data set there doesn't span the entire temporal range of the Camel's Hump monitoring. And these two data sets are highly correlated, so I was able to use linear regression to fill in the temporal gaps um, of the Underhill data set to yield a single pollutant value for each census year. So to put all of that information together with generalized dissimilarity modeling for objective one, again characterizing the elevational gradient in the forest composition, what the model looks at is the dissimilarity in species composition between plots, so plot one versus plot two, as a function of how different those two plots are in elevation. And then it goes through and does all pairwise comparisons for the 85 total plots. Similarly, for objective two, rather than looking at plots, we're comparing across time here. So I pulled the entire forest community on Camel Sump in a given year, say for 1965, and I'm comparing the species composition in 1965 to 1979. As a function of how different mean annual temperature was between those two years, same with precipitation and the and, um, atmospheric pollution variables as well. So to get into the first result, again, this is objective one, looking at the spatial change in forest community composition. And what we see is a very strong effect of elevation that is consistent within uh, years. So we have elevation on the x-axis, and each spline here represents a different census years. So there are nine, even though some of them are overlapping each other. The cooler colors represent earlier census periods and the warmer colors represent more recent years, with 2015 being highlighted in yellow. And what we can see here is that the shape of the response curve is relatively uh, shallow, if not flat, at the lowest and highest points of our elevational gradient, which corresponds to not a lot of species compositional change in those two parts of the elevational or environmental gradient. We also see a pretty steep slope uh, in the mid-elevational range, which we know corresponds to this boreal deciduous ecotone, where there's a high rate of turnover within a relatively short uh, spatial period, or spatial scale. So this is pretty much what we uh, expected to see. But one thing that was quite interesting was that the steepness of turnover was reduced significantly in the latest census year. So this is saying across the entire elevational gradient from the lowest point to the highest point, there's not as much turnover in species composition uh, in 2015 as we have seen previously. And this reflects a more homogenous forest community. 
So to take a, a deeper look into these splines and looking at the biological response, uh, we looked at four canopy species that are pretty dominant, uh, not only on Camel Sump, but also throughout the region. In these include sugar maple, American beech, red spruce, and balsam fir. Uh, and, I, and I'm showing here the relative abundance of these species for three different benchmark periods. So we see that the mid elevations have shifted from areas of high diversity, species diversity with re relatively low abundance of our key players to uh, areas with uh, lower species, or sorry, high species diversity to lower species diversity with an increased abundance of these four canopy species. And I think what this shows from 1965 to 2015 is we start from this clear separation of our low elevation hardwood deciduous forest and our boreal forest and we're starting to see an intermingling uh, over time. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this and uh, jump to this slide looking at the distribution of these four canopy species along the elevational gradient just to see if the median range has shifted significantly upslope or downslope over time. For, it's hard to see the numbers in the box plots uh, correspond to the total number of observations going into this to making these box plots. Um, Sugar maple has been in continuous decline, as we can see in the top right panel, but has not really shifted its median range, uh, upslope or downslope on camel's hump. And then red spruce is kind of an oddball as it is in many ways, where we see a significant uh, upslope shift in the median elevation from 1965 to 1990, which corresponds with this period of regional decline of this species as a result of atmospheric pollution um, and winter injury. So it's really going to the core of its range across the elevational gradient. And then we start to see this significant downslope movement of the median range in 2015, which again is not what we would expect uh, with climate warming alone. So to look at the temporal models, again, objective two, each uh, plot here represents a different predictor variable in the model. And the first thing uh, that sticks out to me is that annual precipitation and nitrate and ammonium pollution do not explain any of the variance in community compositional change over time. But we are seeing significant effects of both temperature and sulfate pollution. And we have found that sulfate pollution was in fact the most important uh, predictor variable uh, in explaining temporal shifts in the forest community. Uh, I'm going to skip this. As you can ask me during the questions for sake of time, but we did look at low and high elevation forests, uh, and we found a very similar response for low elevation forests, but high elevation forests um, was not, the model was not significant, indicative that changes in climate change and atmospheric pollution were not explaining any turnover in the high elevation forests, which was quite surprising. Uh, so in summary, uh, the forest community we have found is more homogenous on Chemos Hump in the recent census, but we don't really detect evidence of a synchronous upslope movement of individual species. Rather, species are um, having a more of an indivi individualistic response. I think it goes uh, without saying, and I think it's a common theme of this conference, that the species responses to climate change are very complex, and they're not always accounted for. Uh, and climate change models. So for example, it could be this interaction between the declining um, abundance of sugar maple in the lower elevations, allowing red spruce to kind of recolonize that area um, and increase in abundance. Uh, the changes that we see in the forest community on Camel's Hump are relatively reflective of uh, regional change. Again, for example, this recovery of red spruce in recent decades. And then lastly, the temporal models show the importance of the recovery from atmospheric pollution and how there's long-lasting effects of this uh, deposition in the area. And uh, the work also corroborates previous findings of climate effects, particularly temperature uh, on northeastern forest. And with that, I have many people to thank, but I would like to also point out kind of the rock of this data set and it being continued over a 50-year time period. And with that, I will take any questions if I have time. You showed about the, the ecotone that in 1965, sort of the other species mm -hmm. contributed most of the, the, the species at that point, and then in 2015, maple and 
one is. What were those other species? Um, off the top of my head, there's striped maple, mountain maple, ash, um, hobble bush is also in that area. Birch, white birch, paper or paper birch, heart leafed birch. Might be confusing this, but yeah. In, in that similar uh, graph, I noticed uh, also a transition between the 1990 and the current. And I was wondering, what, does the 98 ice storm and kind of this ecotone, uh, when I think of that area, I think of mountain birch a lot. Mm -hmm. um, does the 98 ice storm have any impact in the species composition shift as well? It may. Um, I, was that 1998 or 1990? 98. 98. Um, I'm not sure, um, but I would, was it regional ice storm? Yeah. Okay. Safe guess is yes, it does um, influence that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. There's a lot of research in, in Quebec that has looked at uh, latitudinal uh, shifts of ecotones and the time scale that it actually takes for maple to move into, let's say, the boreal forest. Mm -hmm. We're looking at an ecotone that will eventually become exclusively deciduous. And then for it to actually make any headway into the boreal, we're looking at thousands of years, mm -hmm. at least for uh, model predictions. So my, my question would be, in, in terms of the time scale, um, we're looking at 40 or 50 years of this, this data, is it just the canopy trees we're looking at here? Is there any migration of the, the seedlings that, that show that this will actually help? Or is temperature actually playing such a significant impact on, on deciduous recruitment that it's wiping out and there's priority effects being played in the forest floor? So there's no actual shift happening that it was set for recession that, that's being shown. Right. So my. Um Data include both canopy tree species and understory seedlings, anything greater than two centimeters dBH. But we didn't look at if uh, seedlings were moving further, if there was a mismatch in where seedlings were establishing versus the canopy trees, but other people have done so in the region. Um, this is a study that has showed that red spruce and sugar maple have actually moved down slope compared to um, the, where the adult trees or canopy trees are present. I have not looked at that. That's a good point. Yeah, I've not looked at that. All right, thank you.